Welcome back to Mr. Smoot's Story Time. Today I'm reading a story that was written almost a hundred years ago, back when people were riding in cars like this. The story is called The Velveteen Rabbit, or How Toys Become Real. Now, if it's a story about a toy that becomes real, do you think this is a fiction story or a nonfiction? Because fiction are stories that are made up, and nonfiction are stories that are true. So, if this is a story, about a toy that becomes real, what do you think it is? Fiction. Exactly. But it's still fun to imagine what it would be like if toys became real. Last Christmas, in my kindergarten class, one of my students gave me this little elf. I call it Mr. Smoot Elf. Could Mr. Smoot Elf become real and walk around? Only in a book. And in the book we're about to read, we're going to find out what happens to the Velveteen Rabbit. The Velveteen Rabbit. Written by Marjorie Williams, with illustrations by William Nicholson. There was once a Velveteen Rabbit, and in the beginning, he was really splendid. He was fat and bunchy as a rabbit should be. His coat was spotted brown and white. He had real thread whiskers, and his ears were lined with pink sateen. On Christmas morning, when he sat wedged in the top of the boy's stocking with a sprig of holly between his paws, the effect was charming. There were other things in the stocking, nuts and oranges and a toy engine, and chocolate almonds, and a clockwork mouse, but the rabbit was quite the best of all. For at least two hours, the boy loved him. And then aunts and uncles came to dinner, and there was a great rustling of tissue paper and unwrapping of parcels. And in the excitement of looking at all the new presents, the Velveteen Rabbit was forgotten. For a long time, he lived in the toy cupboard or on the nursery floor. And no one thought very much about him. He was naturally shy. And being only made of Velveteen, some of the more expensive toys quite snubbed him. The mechanical toys were very superior and looked down upon everyone else. They were full of modern ideas and pretended they were real. The model boat, who had lived through two seasons and lost most of his paint, caught the tone from them, and never missed an opportunity of referring to his rigging in technical terms. The rabbit could not claim to be a model of anything, for he didn't know that real rabbits existed. He thought they were all stuffed with sawdust, like himself. And 
he understood that sawdust was quite out of date and should never be mentioned in modern circles. Even Timothy, the jointed wooden lion who was made by the disabled soldiers and should have had broader views, put on airs and pretended he was connected with government. Between them all, the poor little rabbit was made to feel himself very insignificant and commonplace. And the only person who was kind to him at all was the skin horse. The skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was so old that his brown coat was bald in patches and showed the seams underneath. And most of the hairs in his tail had been pulled out to make string bead necklaces. He was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger, and by and by, break their mainsprings and pass away. And he knew that they were only toys and would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful, and only those playthings that are old and wise and experienced Experienced, like the skin horse, understand all about it. What is real? asked the rabbit one day, when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender, before Nana came to tidy, tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen often to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loosen the joints, and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. I suppose you are real, said the rabbit. Then he wished he had not said it, because for he thought the skin horse might be sensitive. But the skin horse only smiled. The boy's uncle made me real, he said. That was a great many years ago. But once you are real, you can't become unreal again. It lasts for always. The rabbit sighed, 
He thought it would be a long time before this magic called real happened to him. He longed to become real, to know what it felt like. And yet, the idea of growing shabby and excuse me, of growing shabby and losing his whiskers was rather sad. He wished that he could become it without those uncomfortable things happening to him. There was a person called Nana who ruled the nursery. Sometimes she took no notice of the playthings lying about, and sometimes, for no reason whatsoever, she went swooping about like a great wind and hustled them away in cupboards. She called this tidying up, and the playthings all hated it, especially the tin ones. The rabbit didn't mind it so much, for wherever he was thrown, he came down soft. One evening, when the boy was going to bed, he couldn't find the china dog that always slept with him. Nana was in a hurry, and it was too much trouble to hunt for china dogs at bedtime. So she simply looked about her, and seeing that the toy cupboard stood open, she made a swoop. Here, she said, take your old bunny. He'll do to sleep with you. And she dragged the rabbit out by one ear and put him into the boy's arms. That night, and for many nights after, the velveteen rabbit slept in the boy's bed. At first, he found it rather uncomfortable, for the boy hugged him very tight, and sometimes he rolled over on him, and sometimes he pushed him so far under the pillow that the rabbit could scarcely breathe and he missed, too, those long moonlight hours in the nursery when all the house was silent and his talks with the skin horse. But very soon, he grew to like it. For the boy used to talk to him and made nice tunnels for him under the bedclothes that he said were like the burrows the real rabbits live in, and they had splendid games together in whispers when Nana had gone away to supper and left the night light burning on the mantelpiece. And when the boy dropped off to sleep, the rabbit would snuggle down close under his little warm chin and dream with the boy's hands clasped close round him all night long. And so time went on, and the little rabbit was very happy, so happy that he never noticed how his beautiful velveteen fur was getting shabbier and shabbier, and his tail became becoming unsown, and all the pink rubbed off his nose where the boy had kissed him. Spring came. They had long days in the garden, for wherever the boy went, the rabbit went too. He had rides in the wheelbarrow and picnics on the grass and lovely fairy huts built for him under the raspberry canes behind the flower border. And once 
When the boy was called away suddenly to go out to tea, the rabbit was left out on the lawn until long after dusk, and Nana had to come and look for him with the candle because the boy couldn't go to sleep unless he was there. He was wet through with the dew and quite earthy from diving into the burrows the boy had made for him in the flower bed. And Nana grumbled as she rubbed him off with the corner of her apron. You must have your old bunny, she said. Fancy all that fuss for a toy. The boy sat up in bed and stretched out his hands. Give me my bunny, he said. You mustn't say that. He isn't a toy. He's real. When the little rabbit heard that, he was happy, for he knew that what the skin horse had said was true at last. The nursery magic had happened to him, and he was a toy no longer. He was real. The boy himself had said it. That night, he was almost too happy to sleep, and so much love stirred in his little sawdust heart that it almost burst, and into his boot button eyes that had long ago lost their polish, there came a look of wisdom and beauty, so that even Nana noticed it next morning when she picked him up and said, I do declare if that old bunny hasn't got quite a knowing expression. Near the house where they lived, there was a wood, and in the long June evenings, the boy liked to go there after tea to play. He took the velveteen rabbit with him, and before he wandered off to pick flowers or play at brigands among the trees, he always made the rabbit a little nest somewhere among the bracken, where he would be quite cozy. For he was a kind-hearted little boy, and he liked Bunny to be comfortable. One evening, while the rabbit was lying there alone, watching the ants that ran to and fro between his velvet paws in the grass, he saw two strange beings creep out of the tall bracken near him. They were rabbits like himself, but quite furry and brand new. They must have been very well made for their seams didn't show at all, and they changed shape in a queer way when they moved. One minute, they were long and thin, and the next minute, fat and bunchy, instead of always staying the same like he did. Their feet padded softly on the ground, and they kept, and they crept quite close to him, twitching their noses, while the rabbit stared hard to see which side the clockwork stuck out. For he knew that people who jump generally have something to wind up, but he couldn't see it. They were evidently a new kind of rabbit altogether. They stared at him, and the little rabbit stared back, and all the time their noses twitched. Why don't you get up and play with us? One of them asked. I don't feel like it, said the rabbit, for he didn't want to explain that he had no clockwork. Ho, oh, 
said the furry rabbit. It's as easy as anything. And he gave a big hop sideways and stood on his hind legs. I don't believe you can. I can, said the little rabbit. I can jump higher than anything. He meant when the boy threw him, but of course he didn't want to say so. Can you hop on your hind legs? asked the furry rabbit. That was a dreadful question, for the velveteen rabbit had no hind legs at all. The back of him was made all in one piece like a pincushion. He sat still in the bracken and hoped that the other rabbits would notice. I don't want to, he said. But the wild rabbits have very sharp eyes. And this one stretched out his neck and looked. He hasn't got any hind legs, he called out. Fancy a rabbit without any hind legs. And he began to laugh. I have, cried the little rabbit. I have got hind legs. I am sitting on them. Then stretch them out and show me like this, said the wild rabbit. And he began to whirl around and dance till the little rabbit was quite dizzy. I don't like dancing, he said. I'd rather sit still. But all the while he was longing to dance, for a funny new tickly feeling ran through him, and he felt he would give anything in the world to be able to jump about like these rabbits did. The strange rabbit stopped dancing and came quite close. He came so close this time that his long whiskers brushed the velveteen rabbit's ear. And then he wrinkled his nose suddenly and flattened his ears and jumped backwards. He doesn't smell right, he exclaimed. He isn't a rabbit at all. He isn't real. I am real, said the little rabbit. I am real. The boy said so. And he nearly began to cry. Just then there was a sound of footsteps and the boy ran past near them with a stamp of feet and a flash of white tails. The two strange rabbits disappeared. Come back and play with me, called the little rabbit. Oh, do come back. I know I am real. But there was no answer. Only the little ants ran to and fro, and the bracken swayed gently where the two strangers had passed. The velveteen rabbit was all alone. Oh dear, he thought, why did they run away like that? Why couldn't they stop and talk to me? For a long time he lay very still watching the Brecken and hoping that the rabbits would come back. But they never returned, and presently the sun sank lower, and the little white moss fluttered out, and the boy came and carried him home. Weeks passed, and the little rabbit grew very old and shabby. But the boy loved him just as much. He loved him so hard that he loved all his whiskers off and the pink lining to his ears turned gray. 
and his brown spots faded. He even began to lose his shape, and he scarcely looked like a rabbit anymore, except to the boy. To him, he was always beautiful. And that was all that the little rabbit cared about. He didn't mind how he looked to other people, because the nursery magic had made him real. And when you are real, shabbiness doesn't matter. Then one day, the boy became ill. His face grew very flushed, and he talked in his sleep, and his little body was so hot that it burned the rabbit when he held him close. Strange people came and went in the nursery, and a light burned all night. And through it all, the little velveteen rabbit lay there, hidden from sight under the bedclothes. And he never stirred, for he was afraid that if they found him, someone might take him away. And he knew that the boy needed him. It was a long, weary time, for the boy was too ill to play, and the little rabbit found it rather dull with nothing to do all day long. But he snuggled down patiently and looked forward to the time when the boy should be well again. They would go out in the garden amongst the flowers and the butterflies and play splendid games in the raspberry thicket, like they used to. All sorts of delightful things he planned. While the boy lay half asleep, he crept up close to the pillow and whispered them in his ear. And presently the fever turned and the boy got better. He was able to sit up in bed and look at picture books while the little rabbit cuddled close at his side. And one day, they let him get up and dress. It was a beautiful sunny morning and the window stood wide open. They had carried the boy out onto the balcony, wrapped in a shawl, and the little rabbit lay tangled up among the bedclothes thinking the boy was going to the seaside tomorrow. Everything was arranged, and now it only remained to carry out the doctor's orders. They talked about it all, while the little rabbit lay under the bedclothes, with just his head peeping out, and listened. The room was to be disinfected, and all the books and toys that the boy had played with in bed must be burnt. Hurrah, thought the little rabbit. Tomorrow we shall go to the seaside. For the boy had often talked of the seaside, and he wanted very much to see the big waves coming in and the tiny crabs in the sandcastles. Just then, Nana caught sight of him. How about his old bunny? she asked. That, said the doctor. Why, it's a mass of scarlet fever germs. Burn it at once. What? Nonsense. Get him a new one. He mustn't have that anymore. That was not the end of the story of the Velveteen Rabbit. I just ran out of time and I'll have to finish the book next week. But while you're waiting to hear the end of the book, why don't you choose a toy you have? I could choose Mr. Smoot Elf and make up a story about what it would be like if that toy 
became real.